this is Network Zero, and this is Frequency Shift number three. And I am joined again by James. Hello. Hi there. And I'm your regular host, Chris. And um, this is our Kingdom Death special continuing. Uh, well, continuing special of, not special, but series of, of Kingdom Death focused episodes. Um, and this time we're going to be looking at the antelope and maybe we'll look at the phoenix if we get that far uh and also kind of like what the first innovations and things you do with the settlement because i think last time we talked about like the initial settlement locations and what you can make so all the rawhide armor so this time around we'll be looking at innovations and principles that are good choices when you start out um so to begin with so james you because you're moving um you yeah. you um fast forwarded your campaign end so you could actually just have some sort of conclusion which is a good idea there's nothing there's no reason why you shouldn't do that just to due to if you've got that kind of circumstance to at least mm -hmm. give everyone involved a good um conclusion so you brought the uh, the watcher forward a lot and well i am um, faced him down i moved the uh the introduction element or the introduction story event 2 years early Mm -hmm. effectively so um you can wake it up to fight it as soon as you find it yes you can so yeah it wasn't like it wasn't too much of a skip the worst the worst thing or the thing that we skipped that probably would have had the most impact is another nemesis encounter which is oh, mostly yeah. throwing four people down a hole <laughs> yes um, nemesis encounters um so how did your how did you find the watcher how was that um we we thought at first it was a little bit hopeless almost we we did a lot we did a lot of damage but then it just seemed to it just seemed to be so much health that we weren't going to be able to overcome it at which point afterwards when we when we got to the point where we all died and we couldn't uh, we couldn't bring any more reinforcements in um it re we realized that he's actually meant to have half your lanterneer's health rather than health equal to the lanternier so we'd actually beaten him a few turns before everything went to pieces yeah it's 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 um yeah because he 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 has a health pool mm. and he also has because he doesn't lose ai cards yeah. uh, but that's a thing for another another episode to talk entirely about that um but yeah he's and he's not as tough as well um so he's easier to wound uh if you've brought him forward, which is fine because, uh, as you say, it, it means that because you you obviously didn't get to run the game to a the the norm to a conclusion in a normal way, you haven't innovated and created all the badass weaponry that you can get hold of. So I guess um, I guess it all balances out quite well. Yeah, like the I think we certainly enjoyed. Um, we certainly had an advantage from. The lower toughness, but then we didn't get to use the uh, the special stuff. We should probably uh, we should probably preface this with a spoiler warning, really. Um, but spoilers in this podcast, as it is. But um, yeah, yeah, it was um, it was good. It was a, and it's a really it's a really nice fight to finish the campaign on. Um, it's a really interesting monster. You don't fight anything quite like it during the rest of the campaign. Yes, definitely. Cool. And yeah. So I'm obviously trucking along with uh, my Dragon King, People of the Stars campaign. Yeah, oh, that's um, so exciting. That's getting kind of crazy now. So it's like Lantern Year 11, mm -hmm. uh, maybe going on Lantern Year 12 now. So I think there's a nemesis coming up. So I faced the Tyrant twice, and he's a bit tricksy uh, as a nemesis. So you, you, you face him. So the, nemesis, the Tyrant is the human form of the Dragon King. Lovely. So he and he's in charge of the settlement. So you're not facing these these strange uh, denizens of the empire that your poor settlement is part of. You're actually, you know, being tested by the Dragon King. And of course, if you beat him, you get some great loot off him. You get some really decent loot. So, you know, Dragon Vestment, which is a uh, I've got three sets of that. It's a single card, gives one armor to all locations, and means when you gain a fighting art, you get to choose, pick one. Of your choice of the um, the dragon trait 
ones. So if you've already got, like, if you're looking to fill in your dragon traits, I think I talked about this last time, you're filling in these traits to get your, your survivors closer to being the people of the stars. Yeah. And so being able to pick the fighting arts that you need to do that is quite useful. Um, and there's three in total that you need definitely need as traits. So being able to, like, you know, fast track through to those is really great. Um, and then... What else did I get off him? Celestial Spear, which is badass. Um, which is like a, a, it's like strength four, reach two, speed two. It's metal. It's not two handed as well, which is quite impressive for a spear. Um, and it gives you plus five strength if you have a constellation, which I now have a survivor with. So once you fill in a row or a column of the dragon traits, you get a constellation assigned to based upon what you fill in. So yeah, I now have a um, survivor with a constellation. I can't mm-hmm. remember which one. It gave her some ability, uh, I think. But it's it's pretty good. But you need you know you need to have people of the stars. Uh, once they get a constellation, that counts being one of the people of the stars, and only they can fight in the final battle of uh-huh. the campaign. So, you so have to get your I, ones. yeah, so I she's getting kind of slightly retired from fights for a while while I train up other people. She'll mostly come in once I start fighting um, bigger and harder things because I don't want her XP to just like you know tick over and have to retire her until I do the final fight. Um, yeah, so it's it's a good campaign. It's um, it's interesting. Of course, I've also faced the Dung Beetle Knight, and that's another interesting uh, expansion and battle. So I've got some uh, harvesting to do uh, from from uh, the Black Harvest event, which you trigger by like you know, basically it's underground harvesting of like necrotic kind of crap. It's weird, but great yeah. fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about the antelope. Um, to start off with. So the Screaming Antelope uh, turns up on about Lantern Year 4, I think? 3 or 4? I think it's... A, uh, yeah, actually, that's probably... Maybe 2, that. maybe two, three, four, something like that. But you um, you get a Survivor Gains an ability, which is the... Well, can get an ability called uh, the Orator of Death. Um, and the whole thing about the Antelope, I think, is it, it's, um, it helps... I'm trying to think what to say most about the antelope. It's got some good equipment you can generate from its part. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very different fight to the lion, which we'll get into about its AI cards. And I think generally there's a lot to do with madness with it. So yeah, um, I think fighting I think, it helps you. Go on, James. So I felt when we when we went to fight the phoenix first, like we played, um, we played our campaign pretty much entirely blind. So. We went to fight it, not really knowing what to expect. You know, we saw there's a big, there's a big mouth on its, uh, its strange, like ribby maw that it's got underneath it. Um, but it plays mm. very, very differently to the lion, and I think that's kind of that kind of feels like it's uh, almost its purpose to begin with. Like you go in there after maybe having killed a couple of lions and going like, yeah, sure, we we know how you kingdom death at this point. We know how this works, and then, for example, it has a uh, a mood that means every turn it automatically attacks someone in its blind spot. Yeah, um, it's, or it can get that mood. It's yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, so on the hunt, there's some cool, there's some interesting events. Um, a carpet of ticks, which I don't think is there's nothing really too um, special about that event. Um, the one which is kind of important, as we said when we were talking about the white lion, is when you're hunting the antelope, you can get an event where it, you find a dead antelope. And that's a problem because if you're unlucky, it will trigger a showdown with a, a white lion um, that obviously killed that antelope that you found. And the white lion is one level higher than the, one, than the antelope you've been trying to find. Um, yeah, if you're not prepared to face a level 2 lion and it shows up, uh, that can ruin your day quite happily. Um, and if it triggers a level 3, um, then, yeah, you're kind of going to cry. Um, so that's where I kind of, like, I have to say with that event, it makes me feel like I've always gone for level 1 antelopes. Yeah, I can I can totally understand that. Um, we, I've, I've fought a level 2 antelope, so I've seen them a little bit harder. And it, it, you know, it made a, it made 
a reasonable difference to it. But yeah, you like going to level two, potentially facing a level three lion is catastrophic if you've gone prepared for a different monster. Mm. And, that, and that's the the big thing with it is you're you you are prepared for um, the antelope, and that turns up in uh, some of the hit location cards that we'll talk about. Mm. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, on the plus side, yeah, if you kill the white lion that, that attacks you, you get two extra screaming antelope resources, but even then, I don't know whether that's a good payoff. I mean, the nice thing about the, the dead antelope event card uh, is if you don't want to have to go through so many hunt events that are going to drain your hunters down, then getting that early dead antelope hunt event to turn up so you can actually fight the white lion, which is what actually you were kind of after. I've done that. I've gone after a dead antelopes, actually hoping to score a level two white lion earlier <laughs> in the, on the hunt chart rather than just going straight for a level two lion. Um, so that's kind of an interesting way to play the game. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. That's quite, uh, that's quite sneaky. I like mm. it. Because it means you don't have to go through the overwhelming darkness and all that stuff. Definitely. So you kind of... And some of its other hunt events make it move further away on the track. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's the potential that, you know, if it moves off the end of the board, you could end up failing the hunt and going into the starvation step. Yeah, exactly. Um, what, have, what else have we got here? Uh, Devoured Grounds, uh, yeah, a bit interesting, kind of. Um, well, not really. Um, there's opportunities to get some in. I would say the point about most the um, the hunt events with the antelope is uh, it seems to move. The, it, it allows the antelope to move around a lot more. So the hunt the hunt is not so linear like it is with the lion. Like yeah, when I say you're linear, not just advancing to a certain point, you're actually pursuing something that is moving around. Yeah, the antelope can get further away or can sometimes come closer. Um, and the other thing with it is there's opportunities to get a lot of um a lot of gear or or understanding out of it so um you can pick up like fr- weird fresh herbs or uh, a large flat tooth so i th- i think really the antelope's an opportunity to get um a lot of resources and especially if you consider the fight itself there's a lot of resources on the board to pick up definitely um and i found that the uh the resources you get from the antelope, I felt like it was quite, there seemed to be quite a lot of hide resources. So if yes. you're trying to make leather later on, it's quite a good alternative. Like the uh, the lion, I think, is quite heavy for bones. Yes, definitely. Um, bones and claws, whereas, yeah, the antelope is definitely hide. And I think maybe organs. It's got they quite kind a few of... organs, yeah. Maybe they're a bit similar on organs, but it's definitely hide. Um, so I think we can look at its AI deck and yeah. fighting it. So the fight, the fight sets up as always. The monsters in the middle of the board, but in this time, it's got a region around it, um, which is I think six squares deep, or is it four squares? Deep? But um, it's a, it's it's a, it's an area around it that's roughly circular in in nature around it. Um, where there's six acanthus plant tokens are placed, and you ignore the normal setup rules for acanthus plants. So they, all six are just dumped in that. The um, fact that this monster is eating away, grazing away on the acanthus plant. Uh, and that's the main feature of its, of how it operates as a monster, isn't it, James? Because it doesn't just... Uh, unlike the lion, which is generally looking to grab someone and take it away from the rest of the group, the I think there's a bit. The antelope is maybe a little bit more predictable. Yeah, the uh, it's. I think once you've once you've had a little once you've had a few turns playing against it, you start to see its patterns a lot more. It does a lot of moves where it goes right across the table. Um, but that means that you start learning that you don't want to be in the cardinal directions of it. Um, and yes, once, you, that's one of once you get that, as you say, it becomes it becomes more kind of predictable and able to you're able to funnel it where you want it. So yeah, because I mean, the first thing is it's always kind of if it hasn't if you're not in range of its action, it's generally always going to do one of two things. If it's in range, it's going to move 
it's going to move to the closest um it'll well it'll move towards the acanthus plant the nearest one there is to graze and you know that's um that can be that's a blessing and a curse because you know where it's going to go but also you want to get the acanthus plant as a resource um and then the other thing is it's um it's got its uh stampede um ar uh, it's not an ar card it's a but it's a trait card hmm. which means at the end of its turn is that right it's end of turn oh, i think it's um, i turn. think you're talking about not diabolical so it targets a random survive from the trample zone is that oh the yeah that's the that's the one, sorry, not trample. Trample is the da- is the damage level it does. Yeah, it's um it's diabolical. Um where it it you know, as you said, it, it moves at full rate at towards the closest survivor along one of those cardinal directions that it's got available to it. So that already means it kind of already means you know where you're going to want to be when when it's attacking. Um so things like dash is always important um range because you want to get out. like the spear are very useful because you can attack diagonally as well so you can kind of keep out of its immediate areas where it's going to be interested yeah yeah exactly so it's kind of like you have to you have to game it in the sense that you're gonna you know it's going to trample one way meaning um you need to kind of like move in a particular way or move out of the way of those directions or at least never Never be in a, never fight it in a way that leaves people set up that it can it can do an attack and then do a trample on multiple targets. So you don't want to have your survivors in a row. So you kind of have to surround it. I think is the trick. Like we we fought the antelope with quite a lot of ranged weapons when we went in, so it yeah. was quite an interesting fight for us because it's actually quite easy to attack it with ranged stuff. Um, you're in danger if you're using the bone darts, though, because they're fragile, which I suppose we haven't got around to talking about that yet. Um, oh, we'll talk about that when we get to the um, any particular uh, of its uh, hit locations. But the, uh, the catgut so, bow was extremely useful for this fight. It just gave us the opportunity to control what we were doing a bit more. Um, yeah. Um, the other things that are interesting about it is it has a lot of attacks, I th- if I remember rightly, looking just through the deck, um, there's a few attacks which are in particular quite nasty towards um, survivors that are knocked down. In fact, there's a lot that attack survivors that are knocked down because, again, it makes it easier for it to do its trample damage and uh, and colliding with uh, the person that's knocked down because they all they can do is obviously dodge. They can't they can't actually move. Um, and the other thing that it, it's able to do uh, is it has a lot of opportunities to the one well the one ai card which is annoying is its chow down which fits in with the acanthus plant which is it's able to regenerate um health and so chow so i think the one it's got is its normal action if it can't do anything else is graze which is where it moves the acanthus plant if it can and once it gets there you remove the token and it regains a ai card from the wound deck back to its normal deck yeah. and chow down is just like that but even more so so it's like a d5 uh you know d5 wounds that it heals so it can be quite annoying in that case you know that it's able to heal itself quite readily definitely like we we spent a lot of time managing acanthus plants before we really started dpsing it so in the first couple of turns we'd mm. quickly gather up as much of it as we possibly could so that it wasn't going to get a chance to gather, uh, graze anything. Yeah. And the other thing is it's, it's quite, it's, it is able at times to, to move quite rapidly. So there are times like where once you've run out of acanthus plants, it does kind of, if it hasn't got anyone to trample against, it does then start becoming quite a bit hard to manage as a monster to kind of, you know, pin down. So, there's a, that's where that I say that balance between do you harvest all the acanthus straight away or not is is important because you kind of need to balance out that you want the acanthus plant to help kind of you know corral the monster into one location not just run around the board with you trying to chase it. I don't know. Did you ever have that happen with it? We we did certainly have some times where it was pairing about all over the shop, um, mm. but as I say, the ranged ability. I think we. We got it down to a point where um, 
it had got itself in a loop with one of its AI cards, I think. Oh, wow, okay. So it kept running forwards with this AI card instead of turning to face people. So right. we just sat off at a diagonal to it and sent someone around to gather up everything on the board and get all the resources and do all of the, uh, do all the terrain interactions. And we, we farmed that one very, like it was a very efficient fight for us. And we got a lot of resources at the end of it. Um, but yeah, it's it awesome. can, like, it can occasionally take someone and just push them off into the distance. And that's really yeah. difficult to get back from. Um, it's also interesting because it's got a lot of stuff that does, again, it's got attacks that, that deal um, some brain damage in places. It's also got, um, at the advanced levels, it's got quite a few kind of AOE kind of attacks, like where it's got like a, where it, it does a trample and it just tramples everyone within four boxes of it. So uh, four squares of it. So it's kind of problematic in that sense that it can just attack everyone uh, nearby. Uh, yeah, it's it's just, it can move around quite rapidly and do lots of things where it moves, attacks, and then moves again. So... You know, like you say, using ranged weapons or, or using the acanthus plants to kind of pin it down and uh, to play the game you want to play is the main is the main thing with it. Um, any particular attack you hate, James? Oh, um, I think there's one where it... Uh, no, that's reaction I'm thinking about. Um, but we had a lot of trouble with bucking. Oh, okay. The mood, say, um, on, yeah. the mood, which means that its blind spot is no longer really a safe place. Um, and that that caught yeah. us out when we first did it, because we were so used to with the lion, you just want to hang out in its blind spot all the time. And then all of a sudden that strategy is not what you want to be doing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's if you've got like a a, a whisker har uh, harp, then maybe you can counteract that, or um, or you just have to risk it and and do a surge and just deal as much damage as you can to the rear, um, yeah, and just take advantage of the fact that you're gonna more easily hit it. Um, there's also some things like you know if you if you do injure it in particular ways, then it's. Uh, it's not going to be able to deal as much damage to you, or some of these attacks aren't even going to take effect anyway. So it's just, yeah, it's just very different to the lion. I think that's the main thing is it's going to move around a lot. It'd be hard to pin down. It's, and it's not good to stand in a row facing it because it will trample a lot of people in one go. Yeah, positioning is... The, um, yeah, positioning is always, as you say, positioning is always important. Um, it's hit locations. What's kind of fun about them? Let's have a look. Oh, remark. well, um, I think one of the ones that can be the the scariest bit is when you hit it and uh, it eats your weapon. Uh, yes, because if you're fighting, yeah, I've actually because I fought it with um with someone and uh, that was my guy with um what? Oh no, did he actually suffer that? I'm trying to think. But yeah, you have to be also careful. If it's not a weapon, if you're using fist and tooth, then you get the dismembered severe injury. It's um yeah, it's that's a pain in the ass that one. I will say because <laughs> yes, if you was it, if you if you fail to wound on a one or two, it consumes the weapon. Ah, uh, I would not want that to happen if you're like using I don't know your favorite steel sword or some other weapon that you've spent quite a lot of resources on uh, accumulating and and getting that weapon. That would just be devastating. Yeah, our um, we had someone who decided early on in the campaign that he was gonna he was gonna play characters with great weapons, and it felt like every single hunt we were having to make him a new great weapon because either it would shatter <laughs> or it would get eaten by a uh, an antelope. And this poor guy, we just never got anywhere with it. That's that's sucks. Uh, yeah, I've never. I mean, I've I've made great weapons in in my games. So I've not got that far yet in um. With the Dragon King, I've not made anything like that. Generally, because I've got other weapons which are better and faster. Um, mm. But speaking of weapons, the other thing that's important with the um, the antelope is it's got quite a few hit locations which are um, susceptible to clubs or shields. Yeah. So what happens on some of these locations is that you get plus two luck when wounding that location with a club or a shield, which is interesting because it's that again it just marks the point where 
you really need to, you, you know, like you say, you begin to kind of plan for particular monsters. So you go in against the antelope, you've got your club and you've got shields, or you've got also ranged weaponry to take advantage of the fact it moves around so much. Against the lion um, at high levels, was it with its um, merciless or zone of death thing where it grabs you at the end of the turn? That's why you start, you know, fighting it with like spears instead of, and, and, and things like things with reach. So. Again, it's different weapons have their advantage against the um, the antelope. Um, is there any other interesting? Oh, any other interesting hit locations before we talk about its trap? Um, ooh, uh, well, it, it has super dense locations, which I, I don't know if the lion has. Uh, I don't think it does. Or if it, no, I don't think it has them. I think it only has what the the antelope. The, or the, no, the the lion. The lion. I yeah, don't think has. the lion has impervious ones, which don't take wounds. That's it. Yeah. Um, whereas you can hit the antelope in the teeth. Um, and the downside of a super dense location is that if you're attacking with a frail weapon, it breaks, which yes. is quite unpleasant. If you're um, if you've made anything like picks or scythes, uh, or no sickles, sorry, um, which is all something you might want to bring, especially because it's got so much acanthus on the map. Yeah, or all your bone weaponry, the axe and sword, and your um, your bone darts. They're all they're all frail. Mm-hmm. So, but then that's interesting when you think about the fact if you played the alternate campaign, um, was it the people of the people of the, oh, people of the, of the skull? skull? Yeah, because for them, anything that is bone weaponry um, is no longer frail. Is no longer frail. And if you're playing with the dung beetle, you can actually make some of your weapons uh, impervious uh, to, you know, they can, they can lose that frail ability, which is um, really, 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 really useful. Yeah. Um, it also has a, um, a first strike location, which I don't know if the lion has any of those, which is one that if you uh, draw that hit location, you have to resolve that location first. Yeah. Um, which is quite interesting. You know, like the. The antelope does feel mechanically. It does feel like it's introducing some new concepts for you to worry about. Um, really, kind of teaches you that not only trying to sort out the uh, the AI cards because the lion, you very much want to know what attacks it's going to do. Whereas the antelope, you actually quite often want to figure out what uh, what you're going to hit. Yes, definitely. So yeah, the um, the cat eye circlet becomes mm. quite important to top deck those. Uh, Top deck, the uh, the hit location you really want to be able to definitely get hold of, um, yeah. So it's um its trap card is I remember in my initial <laughs> yes. campaign I really hated it when it when it triggered because again it just again it it's it it's able to move a hell of a lot more again. So um, the the trap card is basically the attacker is doomed as always. All survivors adjacent to the mo- monster suffer two brain damage per monster level, which is that's hideous, and knock back five, which is also hideous, um, and you're knocked down. So this is where you know I think to fight again, fighting this and fighting higher levels of the lion, you really need to get your um, your insanity up. Uh, but that becomes a problem with the with the with the antelope because if you win and you've got like insanity 20 i think your survivor just walks off into the darkness mad never to be seen again yeah. um but what it does is kind of kind of weird and gross really it's at what the attack actually is so it's gibbering mouth in its belly wails it then slides on its on its exposed teeth on the be- on its belly gibbering away and you turn the monster, what is it, directly away from the attacker and full move in a straight line. And any collision with non-deaf survivors means they get dis- a random disorder. It's just, it just does such a horrific amount of, like, um, insanity, you know, brain damage to everyone around it. And also gets to move uh, a hell of a lot again. This is and why I say, like... push all your, uh, push all your attackers back. Well, all of your survivors, you know, your whole hunting party is probably going to be split up by that, by getting knocked back five in each direction. Yeah, it's it's a pain in the ass. It's really, really annoying. Um, again, that's why, you know, mastery of spears, um, with a, sorry, the specialization in spears to have that chance of uh, stopping a trap location is uh, really important. 
Um, yeah. We had a lot of that trap come up, and it just it caused a lot of trouble, especially because we were fighting it at uh, level two, so it's already got eight movement by that point. Oh, God, and it's dealing, like, four brain damage uh, in yeah. one go. God. Once it knocks everyone back five and goes off eight squares in the other direction, you know, that's that's a couple of turns to catch up with that. And given how fast it's able to move and attack and then also do its its um, diabolical, like, stampede attack, it's just able to, to move and take advantage of everything again. It's yeah. It's not, you know, again, that's why... When that happens, having that those acanthus plants still there, so you know where it's going to go, is then kind of useful. Yeah. So it's a it's a you know harvesting all that acanthus in one go is not going to do you good. But at the same time, you don't want it to regenerate lots of wounds and so forth. So it's a it's a it's a challenge. It's definitely. Um, but I mean, I did find acanthus very useful when I was a. Uh... When I was fighting the monster for my own purposes, because you can um, you can use the acanthus once you've harvested it if you're successful, mm -hmm. and uh, you heal all of your wounds. I think um, you can heal wounds with acanthus, yeah, yeah, uh, which is very nice, especially if you get surprised a couple of times by some some nasty antelope attacks. And resources wise, uh, looking at it, it's um, it's got. A number of um, it's got pelts, it's got a number of organs, it's got flat teeth, it's got shank bone, it's got spiral horn. But James, you were saying like so, I think there is quite a lot of pelts in its um, its resource deck. Yeah, um, maybe not as well. Yeah, like there's four um, four pelt resources, which is quite nice. Um, on top of what you're going to get from the uh, the common resources. Hmm. So you're gonna get quite. You should be able to get quite a lot of stuff. Where I think going for the antelope to um, to help get you along uh, your your resources for leather working is is quite good. Um, especially if you if you do feel like you can handle the level two antelope. Um, oh yeah. You get double. Oh no. You get two. Is it two more or plus? You get plus two uh, basic resource. Oh no, uh, monster resources. Yeah. Isn't it? Um, oh, where's my, uh, my manual? Unfortunately, a lot of my stuff is in boxes as I'm uh, as I'm moving soon. Uh, uh, that can't have been fun packing everything away. Um, I was surprised at how how much I could get packed for Kingdom Death. Um, it's it's all sitting there in a big box at the moment. But I don't I haven't built all of my armor kits. Certainly nothing for. I've not built any silk armor, any dragon armor, any. Um, uh, I've built a couple of sunstalkers, but not all of them. So there's still a lot, a lot that needs to be put together. Yeah, the silk armor is really cool because it's got kind of a, an, uh, an Arabian feel to them. Yeah, and the the weapons look like they're made out of some kind of like lattice work, um, like microfibers and things, which is yeah, is really cool. Hmm. Um, I think that's definitely on my list of things to get because I kind of like with Gorm. With Gorm, I like the I like the armor you get with Gorm. I just don't know whether I like the the monster as much as uh, Spidicules. I think so. I I would definitely say that the Gorm, from a from a yeah, from a purely functional point of view, the Gorm is a lot easier to store than the Spidicules, um, and. A lot of the resources, like a lot of the resources, it's got a lot of the locations are really interesting. Well, they give you some really interesting gear. Um, the Spidicules, I think, is quite a a fun looking expansion. So I'm I'm keen to see how that plays out. And in fact, I will be. Um, I'm thinking of going with a kind of light light and shadow theme for the next campaign I play. So I'm going to go with the Sunstalker. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Sunstalker, Slenderman, maybe the uh, Spidicules as it, it kind of messes around with stuff like that. Um, yeah, next campaign. Oh god, thinking yeah. about next because I've got um I've got the um because Chig was kind enough to pick up for me at Gen Con um the Flower Knight, so I have that coming in Fantastic. the post. So I can definitely s and and the Flower Knight's a um is a quarry, so. Yes. I can definitely see my next campaign being. I guess it's going to be monsters, 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 monsters. Really, to be honest, like, um, and just chucking 
you know, mostly chuck in Slender Man, um, mm -hmm. obviously, and chuck in the Flower Knight, uh, and the Dung Beetle Knight, and uh, the Dragon King, you know, yeah. and just do a, a standard campaign, but with uh, a, a, a ridiculous number of new monsters. Yeah, the um, the knights work well when they're comboed together in a campaign because the uh, the dung beetle knight and the flower knight both have tactics cards. And yes. If you have both of the uh, the knights, you make up the deck from all of those tactics. Yeah. Um, and the flower knight, I think you can fight earlier than the dung beetle, so you can start using them earlier, which is pretty good. Um, yeah. What were we going to look up just then? So we were talking about the antelope, and what do you get if you fight a level two? Uh, four basic resources and six screaming antelope resources. That was it. And the reason why I liked that for um, for hunting the higher level antelopes is you you have a much better chance of getting the resources you want because uh, we weren't we weren't readding cards to the deck, mm -hmm. so we would just draw six cards. And you're most you're very likely to hit at least a couple of hide at that point. Yeah, I think the antelope is pretty much critical to um, to getting all that leather. It also has um, going back to talking about the antelope and its attacks. It's also got that gobble up um, uh, ability, so it's uh, it's able to swallow up with an attack um, your survivors, and then you have to do the crush and devour uh, uh, event. Well story um event which is in the rule book where you know you're you're literally chewed up by um by the the antelope and i've never actually had this happen yet to anyone uh i've been lucky enough that this hasn't happened but also at the same time kind of sad that it hasn't happened because um there's quite an opportunity of like weird stuff happening so if you get gobbled up obviously you can die and the damn thing regenerates and gets faster or um, you escape and obviously you're going to lose a, a limb or a leg um, and it heals a wound as it chews you. Or if you're lucky enough, you can fight back and um, and you can deal damage to it. Or or if you're really lucky when you're fighting back, um, you can uh, a, it's, you gain its second heart strange resource. So like I said, there's still stuff in this game I've never ever got hold of. Uh -huh. um, so that is, um, you know, I hope someone gets gobbled up so I can try and um, free myself from it. But you know, that is on a, a on a seven, eight, nine, ten, and then rolling an eight plus. Like the likelihood of it happening is is um, is low. And then also the fact that if you do it, um, it's going to do wounds to you, uh, and also. You know, it's, it's again. It's that risk of having a survivor go in just to get that one resource that you've you, you've never had before, but you could use to make something pretty phenomenal. Yeah. And it's it's tricky as well because um, while someone's being gobbled up, if the antelope takes two or more wounds in one round, then they get spit out. I think. Yeah. So you know it's quite rare to get in that position, and then you have a very small window of time where you can do the thing before you die. And you might not even get to do that because someone else might attack you and or might attack the antelope and break you out. Mm. Um, there does seem to be a lot of those like very slim edge case scenarios, but I think that's one of the things that lends uh, Kingdom Death a lot of replayability. Uh, yes, definitely. And I mean, we had um, we had a lot of this when we were talking to uh, Andy Chambers and Thomas Pyrnan. Yeah, uh, you know, having having big tables and things that like strange exploration events that go off when you hit one of these weirdly random events. It means that the world just feels a lot more alive and in-depth. That's, um, that's, I think, some of the... Where, um, where books, like RPGs in particular, like books like um, uh, that have done well recently and won awards, like... Um, let me just try and think of the names of them. So I'm talking about... Uh, uh, Red and Pleasant Land, and also uh, that's a D and D book, um, and a few others. And the other book they brought out that followed up, which is Maze of Blue Juice. So they're huge, like dungeon books, but they have also like tons of random tables in there. And D and D players seem to get a kick out of random tables. So it's it's those things where, depending upon the type of game, having these huge tables keep this keep the setting quite fresh without 
um, without much effort, I would say, because it's all written there and you just kind of go through it and you just have to accept the, the good with the bad. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the antelope, I can't remember if there's anything particular about antelopes level two. Um, that's where it gets the, uh, that's where it gets the charging around um, trait level two. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's where it gets yeah. diabolical. At level one, it has trample. Um, and then at level three, it gets hypermetabolism, which I think makes it, uh, it makes it rather unpleasant when it eats things. Yeah. Hmm. But it's a fun fight, and I think that's the main thing, is it, it's it's different enough from the lion that it uh, presents a new challenge, and it, it calls for a different kind of, you know, party setup, hunting party setup, yeah. when you uh, have to face it. And it adds, it does add variety to those early years of hunting, because when when we got to the point that we'd, we fought a couple of lions, and then people wanted to do something different, Mm-hmm. And the antelope definitely feels like a different fight. Um, if you, I mean, it's it's a hugely different fight to the to the lion. Um, you know, the lion you're trying to desperately just like burst it down before it gets a chance to really go ham on you. Whereas the antelope, you know, there's a lot of. I felt the antelope ended up being a thing where there was a lot more positioning and a lot more like thinking it out and what is it going to do next turn and where can we be. Mm. So let's have a look at then. So we've we said about a lot. I think last time we spoke about settlement locations, the first ones that you make, which are um, you know things like the Bone Crafter, uh, the what was it the Bone Crafter? I can't remember all the names. Lantern Horde, obviously, because it's the initial one. Um, Morgan Grinder is that a first one? Morgan or? Grinder, yeah, that's another one. And um, was it the raw where, the raw hide skin, oh, uh, the skinnery. skinnery? Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. But instead, this time, we're going to talk about those first starting uh, innovations and principles. Um, I'm just trying to bring up uh, the principles um, in the rule book. So I guess the first principle you're going to come across ever in your game, and it's going to make a difference, is are you going to be... Uh, is how you treat you know new survivors. So when the first, when the first newborn survivor is rolled up um you have to choose how you want to have your your settlement treat newborns are they uh using the the protect the young or are they doing survival of the fittest and they have um they have particular connotations to to how both intimacy roles are affected uh and also um they give you certain um bonuses on the first the first ones that you uh you make so I've generally always gone with protect the young. Yeah. Uh, because on the intimacy table, I think it gives you, it gives you the option. Was it, is it, it gives you a You roll twice and on... pick the result that you want. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be the highest result. It's whichever one you want. So um, with certain things that you buff your position, uh, gain a buff on the intimacy table, you actually don't, if you manage to get your perfect 10, you can, guarantee that you get that survivor instead mm. of having to go higher um but yeah you know it's it's really good if you want to reliably be able to produce babies yeah but obviously uh, <laughs> if you've got um if you've got survival of the fittest um things aren't going to go as as smoothly uh with with creating new young because survival of the fittest i've never used i mean because it's it's you roll twice, pick the lowest, but all your newborn survivors gain plus one strength. Now that's that sounds great, and it could mean you actually you know, start getting newborn survivors that are born with um, once you've innovated beds as well. Um, mm. so that's important on the intimacy rolls. A bed means newborn survivors are also born with plus one strength. So all these strength bonuses add up, but having to roll twice and pick the lowest does mean you've got a high chance of of losing survivors at a rapid rate. Yeah, and not just not just not being able to 
have the newborns to add, increase your population, you're actually going to be losing people. Yeah, you're even going to lose the couple who you've picked to be the consenting adults to 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 uh, to give to create this new life, or you're going to lose the um, the female in childbirth. It's it's just it's rough. I, that's why I've never used it. But you know, the idea of having them born with plus one strength is pretty pretty good. Yeah, I. It also increases your survival limit by one, which, you know, that's not to be sniffed at as well. Um, yeah. Especially early on, you know, to, to basically be getting a free innovation that increases your survival limit, that could be really good. Um, maybe, maybe I need to play my next campaign with, uh, with, with that and choose that innovation and just, you know, tough it out. Like I believe that the people of the uh, people of the Sun campaign, um, minor spoiler warning here. I believe it forces you to take survival of the fittest. It forces you to take it. Yeah, I think you do not have a choice about um, about how your intimacy uh, your intimacy principle is or your new life principle, but you have a different intimacy table, hmm. which is meant to be not as punishing. Well, I mean, I'll, I'm probably going to play um, People of the Star, oh, no, People of the Sun as my next campaign, as I was saying. So I'll start, I'll start doing a write up of that as I play it. Cool. Because, yeah, because the Dragon King also changes, changes things up with its intimacy table. Um, let me just have a look at it here. So, again, you've got things happen if you've got um, Protect the Young and Survival of the Fittest. And it, depending upon what you then roll, um, it it means that they do protect the young means the child uh, gains the the parent gives the child a noble surname so you give them a surname and it counts as a noble trait uh, and if you've got survival of the fittest it means that the newborn uh, gains a second dragon in dragon's inheritance so again it it further um, speeds your your um, your newborn survivor. Um, Along to uh, along to having all the dragon traits that it requires, so that's it, it, yeah, it's a it's a hard one to to pick and choose whether you want to use that or use the other one. Um, so that's the first one. Uh, I think the other initial um, the other initial innovation you have to pick between is whether you're going to uh, be cannibals or you're going to have graves. Because that's de- that's determined once you have the first death uh, within your um, within your tribe. So cannibalism is, as it says, you when a survivor dies, you draw one basic resource. Um, and I've made quite a lot of stuff thanks to that. <laughs> um, it does it does kind of come in useful. Um, it also has a plus one survival limit. So again, if you were um, if you were going to be a, a bunch of real hard cases out in the darkness. You could, you could believe in survival of the fi- fittest and eat all of your, uh, eat all your dead, and you'd be getting plus two survival pretty much from the get go. Yeah, and of course I've um, been using um, though for the Dragon King. I've been using graves because mm-hmm. now I'm at the point that I'm getting like survivors with really high understanding that they pass, and because of the way my innovations are set up, they pass on so many things that it's actually usually better that I pass on either the understanding or the courage and they get half that amount to the newborn. So the newborn survivors are getting that plus a plus a plus one mean they generally get a hit one of the milestones on their um on their understanding uh rank. And then also you get all the extra um endeavors uh which again can be put to good use whether that's creating more survivors uh, so you can go off and have people breed, or, or in uh, having that extra innovation, so you can, um, so you can uh, go to the shrine, uh, or, or uh, make all that leather armor that you, uh, leather, well, leather to make leather armor with. Um, there's all these things where graves really helps, and I think especially if graves helps the moment you start going up against really um, high level monsters, so you know you're going to have survivors die. Yeah. We found, in my campaign, we found that some of the nemesis, we we just couldn't figure out how to make a star on a couple of them. You know, you'd, you'd go up and they would just butcher you in a few turns. And 
graves meant within one lantern year we'd probably be back up to at least the same population i mean we we were really lucky with our um our augury rolls the amount of times we rolled i think it is like seven or more um to be able to initiate intimacy but you get, yeah augury. exactly but you get you get plus one to that if you've got um if you've got um high enough understanding mm -hmm. so your likelihood of that happening is quite good isn't it yeah um what's the other things we've got i mean you also get to the point in your campaign where you need to make a choice don't you which is um you have to make a choice whether you are um you have to make a choice on the principle of conviction okay and conviction is uh oh no which one's that um society no society is if you've got 15 survivors or more Conviction, yeah. it just happens if you survive a certain number of lantern years. So it's either, either you, you, um, you, oh, yes, 12 lantern of, years. So you've either got the conviction of romantic or you've got the conviction principle of barbaric. So, um, now this is where, this is where, because I had this happen in my current campaign, I went with barbaric, um, because, uh, the barbaric, um, principle is, let me just bring it up. It's pretty good because it means all your survivors get born with plus one strength. So again, you're getting to this point where if you've, if you've picked certain things really fast tracked on what their starting abilities are and their starting attributes are. So I'm literally getting survivors being born with like strengths of two or three, depending upon what I've rolled. And yeah. I think that's now getting to the point where it's going to be they're always going to start with strength three. And one of the key things on dragon trait is a survivor has a strength of three or more. They they cross off that dragon trait. So again, towards the mid game, my survivors are just getting churned out so close to all getting born, almost getting born with a constellation. It's that kind of level of of um, of how advanced they are. Um, and the other thing with when you choose it on the event is I've now got because I I rolled for it. Um, I add hands of heat to the next year, which is a bit weird because I don't have um, the, I don't have the lantern oven. I have a different oven that's specific to the Dragon King. It's an obsidian orb that glows. It's basically a nuclear reactor, as far as I'm aware. Um, yeah, uh, and also um, I've now got a survivor who who. Um, I think is very close to completing courage, which counts as a dragon trait, and I get to go on the event number one hundred on the hunt table. If I go past overwhelming darkness, the next hunt, random hunt event is event one hundred. I can choose when to use it though, when I trigger that, and that means I can. I looked at. That, I can get a ton of great gear out of that. There's. Um, we rolled it naturally during the campaign, and even though we weren't able to get to the. I think it's a hunt event that has about three different stages. Yeah. And when you get to the third stage, we didn't meet the requirements for it. Um, but even the first couple of stages gave us a huge boost. Yeah, I think it's going to be really good when that happens. I can't wait to trigger that. Um, romance, then. The, the, the romantic conviction. Have you used that one? Um, so I went for barbaric as well. Um, the plus one strength just felt at the time, it felt like it was amazing. Um, mm. But the more I think about it, I'd be tempted with romantic, especially because we took um, we took graves, so oh, we can get in additional it. innovation um, endeavors. But it gives you an additional opportunity to innovate, um, and it gives you plus one understanding. So graves and romantic means you're getting two plus uh, two understanding on every new survivor. Wow, actually, yeah, that's a good point. Um, that's is that enough to That's... trigger the first? Uh... Um, if you I choose think you need three for the for, for your first um, block, don't you? Yeah, but one of the dragon inheritances is that if you get the dragon inheritance, the newborn survivor starts with uh, half of one of the parents' uh, understanding. Oh, so even at a low level, um, that already does a lot um, to. It means you can start risking your lower level survivors to be the ones giving you know, making your giving birth to your new one and already getting plus two mm. is pushing pushing you already up to halfway along the understanding track. So that's that's pretty significant that. Um 
now there's the principle you said of society, um, life, society. So that's collective toil or accept darkness. Yeah. Now I think in the I've not got to this stage yet because I've not actually hit having fifteen in my uh, society, which is kind of annoying. Oh. Um, yeah, no, I've, I know. Everyone's been getting. I've, I was almost close to it, then had three people die in one mm. one lantern here, and it pushed me back down. Um, so with collective toil, um, you get plus one endeavor for every ten in your population. Uh, that's pretty good. There's nothing wrong with that. Whereas, um, except the darkness is plus two to all brain trauma rolls, which is pretty significant because it's generally going to mean that your survivors can't now die due to brain damage. Yeah, we we chose except darkness in our campaign, and then promptly forgot about the bonus every time we rolled a brain trauma. <laughs> oh right. Like, looking at it, I'm just thinking, wow, we probably should have lost much less people. Um, yeah, but I mean that's that is again one of the things with Kingdom Death. There are so many moving parts on uh, on all of the cards and so many different interactions. It can be tricky to keep up with all of the benefits and things you're getting. Um, Definitely. But yeah, collective toil to us. Like even though our our uh, settlement hit 15 people, we basically kind of leveled out around 15 or 16 people for the whole campaign. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'd spend a couple of years and we'd always use a couple of endeavours making sure we had more children and then a nemesis would happen and kill four people. So then we'd go a couple more years and have some more kids and then a nemesis would turn up and kill a load of people. Um, so I just can't, I can't imagine ever getting to a point where you had 20 population to get much out of collective toil. Yeah. But I think I think it might be like intended to be for people who are there's a couple of variants in the back of the book and one of them is about, you know, your people don't really die in your settlement, I think. Or at least you don't die from hunts. There's you like you get taken back to your town and you just you just got knocked out. Mm -hmm. It's fine. And I can imagine collective toil being very useful with those variants because you're just going to be, you're probably going to have less of an interest in increasing your village's population. Um, or at least yeah. it's going to be less pressing for you because you're not losing people. Um, but it suddenly means that it's actually just a resource that pushes you to greater heights. Mm. Um, and I'm just looking at the when you trigger the event, what other stuff can happen? Um... Oh, except the darkness at low level, a bunch of survivors get plus ten, plus ten insanity. Uh, that's not to be sniffed at. Uh, or the higher level, uh, a female survivor is herded at the settlement's leader, gain the qui uh, qui uh, quiotic, uh, quiotic disorder, uh, and it cannot be re removed for any reason. In addition, they gain the leader and orator of death fighting arts. Wow, that's kind of neat. Whereas yeah. collective toil is bone witch. Um, oh, I have mixed feelings about the Bone Witch. Um, and a lot of extra survival, and or you can get someone that gains the secretive disorder and timeless eye fighting art. Um, yeah, I think I prefer Except the Darkness. Yeah, and I did, I did feel, now I know this is, this is probably more of like a story thing for me, but we started out with high hopes. You know, we started out going, we're going to protect the young. And then, then we got to like, uh, what's it? We got we got to the point where we're like, are we barbaric? Are we romantic? Well, you know, we're barbaric, but we're we're a you know a settlement. We invent we uh, innovated language and family and beds and things. But by the point we'd got up to fifteen people, we were we were as nasty as some of the monsters in the darkness. Like we were just going out there and ripping lions to pieces. So when it came to Almost, yeah, when it felt like the actual story decision, like, are we going to accept darkness or try and strive towards something better? We had descended to monsterism at that point. And yeah. I mean, it feels, it feels like it is overwhelmingly weighted towards accept darkness. Possibly, um, but I think also at lower, le if you're having, if you're playing it on like a, a relatively hard level, um, where is it? Uh, I'm gonna find the the um, not insight. What's the other one? Insight. Uh, oh, what's the thing where you get where you um you have enough of the 
Uh, is it understanding or is it courage? It's not insight, it's bold. Here we go, yeah. Yeah. So if you've got bold, yeah, then the collective toil and all those extra um, endeavors, and you've got survivors that are matchmakers, you mm -hmm. can really like ramp up the size of your population. So that's yeah. where it, I think that balances out quite where you where that benefit comes in is with collective toil is if you go down the route of you get you get all these extra endeavors what are you spending them on oh you've got a bunch of of survivors who are matchmakers that's where you're yeah, they're just causing your your population to to boom mm -hmm. um so i think if you've got that set up you can quite quickly you know um get a lot of survivors and keep generating them at such a rate that you're never going to have any issues about running out of people which is possibly a good way of fighting then the um the watcher at the end you know because you can then make battalions to fight or you can just keep bringing people on uh yeah. so that's kind of fun i mean i don't have that option uh with the dragon king i don't get um i don't get uh any of those things if you get uh, your courage or your understanding up you don't get to pick any of those Oh, no. You don't have those on your table. You get other stuff instead, which I will give you a hint at. Um, so if you get your milestone on the courage and understanding, where it's different is that you start getting... Um, you instead get... You can, trigger, you can have an intimacy event trigger, or you can gain uh, strength and accuracy tokens. So there's... Um, there's a bit where it depends upon which phase you roll for it. But if you roll high enough on courage, you get like your your surname is reinc is a reincarnated one. So again, you get another dragon trait. You get a random fighting art, which if you're wearing the dragon vestments, means you get to pick one that fits your your um fits your dragon traits that you require. Oh, and you get plus one permanent strength. <laughs> so. And so with these ones, with that version of courage and understanding, you're getting a lot of things that help with your traits. And also your uh, higher level, you're getting the unbreakable fighting art and plus one accuracy. That's with courage. With the understanding, you can get some endeavors or you can get a noble surname at higher levels of random fighting art and plus one evasion. And at higher level, if you're all even higher, you get plus one permanent evasion and uh, the champion's right fighting art. So they all work together quite neatly that you can get lots of things playing out quite well. Um, so you, I don't get matchmaker, so there's no point in me. Um, so I'm to really do the matchmaking and risk it and stuff and risk those endeavors. I'm all about hunting lions to get the, um, to get the, uh, the love, the love potion. Yes. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about some of the other than innovations, I guess. Um, What's important uh, starting off? What are good ones? Ammonia is pretty much standard. I mean, it's always going to turn up early. We were, uh, we it's were gonna absolutely you... plagued with the uh, the mists. So it's kind of... Clean mist, I think. Yeah. We, set them to them. Uh, we yeah. got that some like five times. So ammonia was a definite innovation for us when we got it. Uh, beds, which is a innovation you get after you get ho um, hovels. So beds are useful. This is the intimacy event. Mm -hmm. uh, and all oh. so clan of death plus one accuracy plus one strength plus one evasion for all newborn survivors so this is what i'm saying is like with the dragon king one i'm at the point where if i've got that plus some of the other innovations uh as well i've got survivors starting with like plus three strength it's um, so they're already triggering one of their dragon traits again mm. it's just an insane amount of um damage output that you can then do yeah and the uh the additional accuracy is not to be sniffed at as well. Like I find accuracy is a little bit harder to increase just through yes. natural events. So, well, that here's the th here's the thing. Um, the accuracy. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just find the Dragon King one. I mean, this is all kind of spoilers on the Dragon King. Um, plus one base accuracy is also a dragon trait. <laughs> so, so this thing, you know, you, this is the thing is, I think once you, if you're able to get your settlement surviving long enough, you start triggering lots of things quicker. Okay. Um, cooking. So we innovated cooking, and then we did <laughs> okay. the event, and because we, because we were looking at, because we went into everything blind, we did the cooking event, and it said, you now get to pick one of these recipes, and we looked at it and went, we haven't got any of that. Yeah. It's um, really, really specific, that one. Yeah, like you need 
pretty much every single one of them it needs to have vermin for it. Yeah, you need to. Uh, but then this is where the dung beetle knight comes in because it starts with a um, it has a uh, a bug patch on the board. Ah. So you can start. You, essentially, you can farm it for 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 insects. That is handy. Yeah. Um. So drum. Oh, sorry. Go on. Well, hovel. Um, I don't know if we mentioned hovel yet, but I think it's hovel that means that you can get survivors or saviors. Yes, that's really important. And we it was actually the first thing we picked. Um, and my group turned down Symposium for Hovel, which to me felt like a horrible choice. But then we rolled up a saviour on our first intimacy. So I was pretty okay with that. Yeah, game <laughs> save, yeah having that and um, your uh, Protect the Young innovation hmm. um, principle sorry yeah it means you're gonna get you're gonna generate saviors like really quite often and that's it's just so important um let's see what other early ones are there um hovel inner lantern is inner lantern took ages for me to innovate last when i played my first campaign and it got to the point where when you start facing bigger beasties which also have attacks that occur at the end of its turn and so forth um, yeah being able to get those extra attacks in with your with your survivors that now have really quite advanced attributes is really important. So, in a lantern like that one and uh, language, you start off immediately with um, the other ones like it that give you dash. So that's the paint and what's the other one? Encourage you start with because that's language. Uh, the one that gives you dodge, that um. is, but they're all important. Getting hold of that set is like. You know, one of the first things possibly to start gunning for um, when you start off your settlement. Um, okay. Symposium is nice because it gives you a little bit more um, opportunity to focus on things that you're after. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I um, I was going to say, oh, what was the one that I was... Um, family. We have. I don't think we've really talked about family. Okay, yeah. Um, which is one of the... Uh, one of the really inter- like I found that quite interesting because that's where I don't know if you get family in the uh, Dragon King. No, expansion. you get you get you get a different one which is Bloodline. Uh, but yeah, family lets you. Um, where are we? Uh, you get to pass things on, so you pass on half of your weapon proficiency to um, to your children to anyone. Well, yes, when two people have a child, you get to give both of the parents a surname. And you get to pass on the surname to one of the children, or to the children, and they gain half of the weapon skill of the parent rounded down. Yeah, and you know that's that's pretty funky. You get to actually have children who are decent with some of the weapons, and if you've been specialising in anything, or if you have any weapon sets, like we had one guy in our campaign who was desperately trying to uh, to get a line of guitar users. And every single one of them ended up having their arms ripped off. Oh God! Um, it seemed to be the curse. Like if you if you took the cat blades, you were going to lose your arms. Yeah, because I mean the, the thing with it is so that you can essentially people to hopefully being weapon masters because you know you you may not always want to send out the same person on a fight all the time, but you want to try and get people up on their weapon mastery. I guess that fits in quite well then with um, uh, nightmare training, which isn't an early one to get hold of, but it does give you the chance of increasing um, weapon proficiency. Uh, but it is costly um, to train there. Uh, again, Dragon King, I think, changes up a bit um, what nightmare training is. Uh, paint, as I said, gives you dash, so that gives you an, you can spend survival for extra movement, which is awesome. Um, partnership. I've never innovated. Oh, I think I did, but I never found it useful. Yeah, I think we had we considered it to be a downside, um, so we just didn't innovate it when we uh, we got it. Um, but shrine now, shrine is an absolute MVP must pick. I found because the uh, the opportunity to gain plus one armor to all locations for the cost of the inde- an endeavor. Yeah. That just, I mean, that saved our butts when we went up against the, um, uh, the end boss. It really turned things around mm. for us. Um, Definitely. 
it's 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 such a great little location even if it just generates insanity it's brilliant um it's so useful um i think whichever ones we've got uh again some of these you know you're only going to get something if you roll really really high um uh ultimate weapon you're not going to get until right at the end of the game and that just basically it's so you can fast track making um making specific gear specific gear which is fine and symposium is great because it just means again you fast track uh your innovation you can be even more selective on what you want to innovate um and i think I mean, sculpture sculpture is quite a good one for uh, nemesis encounters um because you gain plus two survival when you head out and it leads to um it leads to pottery which means that you get to save resources mm. if your uh, your settlement stuff gets destroyed which is very yeah, I, that's that's quite specific to what was it the um, the butcher I think how he attacks. Um, scrap smelting, of course, is really important because um, it means you can get hold of iron, which you're definitely going to need, and you can make the black, which is the only way you're going to get towards, of course, making some of the even you know bigger weapons and the lantern armor. Um, but I think that's the thing with the innovations. This. There's always generally a hard choice to pick, and some are definite things to take because they increase the survival limit, or there's some which are definite choices because they give you the survival on when you leave to go on a fight. Hmm. And it's picking between those is often quite difficult. Yeah. Um, but there are some which I think are really basics to have. Yeah, I do like that some of the uh, some of the innovations as well. They do things outside of just existing as an effect on your settlement. You'll maybe defeat a monster, and it will say, "If you've got, you got Memento Mori, yeah. yeah, do this new thing." Um, and that kind of gives you that feeling of exploration. Like you don't, you don't know entirely how these things are going to be useful, but they end up being useful in places you might not have expected. And that is that was really cool for me. Cool. Um, so that's innovations. I know we uh, we haven't actually talked about the gear for the um, the antelope. Oh, have we not? Okay, let's talk about that. Um, and I I thought I'd have a little bit of a because I've I've got it laid out here on the tables, some of the stuff that you get from the uh, the the area you make for the antelope is the stone circle. Yeah. Um, and you know it's got some interesting stuff. It's got some uh, a pair of katars, which are interesting if you're making a katar user. The um the interesting point about the bone knuckles is when you wound with it, the monster gains minus one toughness until the end of the attack. Which is great because if you've got a pair of those. Yeah. And, and you're rocking, I don't know, uh, white lion armor. Um, you're going to generally be hitting with what? Five? five but, your attack is what? Going to be five dice? Yeah. So you're, you're quite likely to start like chipping its toughness down. And that's going to make every success. Um, yeah, that's going to make every successive attack easier and easier. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's, it, it's until the end of the attack. The attack counts as all the dice that you roll. Yeah. So it means all the we any out of those five attacks, say you've got five because that's the speed you're at. Um, any of those that have hit are going to have good odds of winding. Um, I think Beast Knuckles is the next thing I need to innovate because I've got like um, I well possibly that I don't know I I'm not too sure what I'm doing. I'm, I've got a complete set of uh, armor from from the uh, antelope. Um, but speaking of Beast Knuckles, because Beast Knuckles is a paired weapon. The yeah. blood paint, uh, ah, a really yes. interesting thing. So, do you want to do you want to give us a lowdown on blood paint then? Oh, yeah. So, blood paint is where you you spend for that attack when you do it, you can activate the weapons that are left and right of blood paint at the same time, as long as they're not two handed, and so it counts as two separate attacks. Uh, but you get to activate both. And I have done this. So, if you've got like say a sword master or axe masters or anything else like that, and you've got like uh, that those um, weapon masteries or weapon specialism, and you've got enough weapons, um, you can really start having some fun with um, you know someone that's dual wielding swords or dual wielding axes or dual wielding clubs 
or even if they're say rocking a sword and shield because you can then do um an attack with both of those while also then maybe doing a surge afterwards to gain the uh, block advantage that the shield gives you so you can oh. really start doing some a lot of damage and tactical um things uh yeah it's good fun that uh yeah. blue charm um, oh yeah so the charms are um the charms pretty interesting because they have a completed affinity on the charm itself mm -hmm. um is there a green charm as well as the blue and the the red yes oh i can't seem to find it in my oh there we go um so yeah but then they um they have a pretty pretty kick-ass ability but you have to have five of that colored affinity on it yeah it's they're hard to kind of get the whole lot of but again with the charms, they really come into their own when they're used with uh, the saviour of that particular colour. Yeah. Because saviours get a certain number of um, automatic... They get an automatic number of affinities of that colour based upon, I think, their age? I can't quite remember. Um, I think they get bonuses on... Um, they get bonuses dependent on the amount of their coloured affinity. Oh, that's it, yeah. But they count um, as having one of those affinities. Um, mm. they get a permanent affinity. So if you take a charm, that's already two that you've got, and then you, know, you just need to rack up the rest with correct junctioning of gear. And I think that's going to be and, even... That's going to be so useful in the Sunstalker campaign because one of the abilities you can get is the fact that all of your socketed... Uh, all of your completed junctions count as whatever colour you want. Oh, wow. So, so I don't get... So yeah, sorry, so in, in a basic campaign, I was going to say, in a basic campaign, like if you look at like um, a savior, the, the red one, for each red affinity, he gets uh, one of the attacks hits automatically. Yeah. One of your uh, dice rolls on the attack hits automatically. Um, and that is significant. But like the green savior gets one armor for every green affinity. Mm. And that's one armor to every location. So if you've got five green affinity, that's plus five armor. Whereas, like with the blue save, you get plus one rain for each, um, or you get plus one reach for each uh, blue affinity. Yeah. So you're now looking at spears with reach, you know, up to reach seven. And it even gives reach to Mimi weapons as well. Um, yes. So you could it's... you could have a Qatar. I mean, I I love the idea of a Qatar user because you get bonus luck based on your age. Um, a Qatar user like standing on the far side of a battlefield, waving their arms in the air, and then the monster just exploding. Exactly. Um, <laughs> but like again, I don't know. In the Sunstalker, do you get does in that campaign? Do you get saviors? I don't think you get saviors, but you have other things to make your uh, to make your babies kick ass little terminators. Yeah, because of um, course I don't get saviors. I get people of the stars who have constellations. But of course. To get there, um, you get the iridescent hide, okay. which gives you plus one armor for each type, each color type uh, affinity you have in your grid. Oh. So charms help along that way if you don't want to do certain armor combos to achieve the affinities, but it's not that difficult to achieve anyway. But um, yeah. you know, again, for an easy plus three armor, um, plus your innovation if you go to the shrine to get an extra plus one plus whatever armor you're wearing and bonuses, it's, um, I'm rocking a lot of, you know, mixed armor um, in fights. Uh, bone earrings, they're cool, though I've never used them. Um, um, what have we got for bone earrings? Start the showdown, gain speed and strength tokens, if insane. Um, and if all... gear has the bone key. That's another one that's probably very good if you're playing People of the Bone. Oh, no, yeah, People of so the Skull. Think, <laughs> yeah, so I think also, I'm not too sure which armor sets are pure bone. There's mostly something which has got a lot of bone in the armor. Um, but again, that might be mixing and matching the right bits to get the right um, the right armor sets yeah. to do that. Uh, right, what else have we got? I in, mean, you've um... got Boss Mendy, which is a, t a tattoo. Yes. Um, which can give people additional speed, which is frankly amazing. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a weird setup, I think, mm -hmm. to get it going, but having extra speed on people, like rolling more dice, means you're going to get more hits, and you're going to be able to do more wounds, which is mostly good. Um, yeah. But one of the things that I quite liked the look of is the um, the actual set of armor has uh, 
it kind of confused me when I was first looking at it, because if you look at things like the braces, it goes, when you slam. And I thought, mm. what is a slam? How, how is this? But it's, it strangely exists as a, uh, as a set. There's this interesting move where you get to, um, if you have the coat, you get to use your movement to charge forward in a, uh, a straight line and then knock the monster back um, mm-hmm. and reduce its toughness. And I think the I think the armor set bonus increases your slam as well. I think it means you can slam through friendly models. So the br- the braces let you pass through uh, other models. Oh, um, yeah. The if you have the full set, uh, you may move one space. Uh, after you slam, you may move one space and gain plus two strength until end of turn. Um, so that actually becomes this this kind of weirdly effective way of like repositioning monsters, um, repositioning yourself afterwards a little bit. And I, I really like the idea of someone wearing the screaming coat or the screaming antelope gear and maybe having um, a, weighted ca- a counterweighted axe or a spear. Uh, I've been using it with a spear because <laughs> you can then push it. You can then like push the monster away mm. and then attack. Yeah. And still be able to attack or push it into a position where you can have um, where they can attack and then you, you've also already set it up so another survivor can attack but then that survivor because they haven't yet moved can then run away ah so you can push it in somewhere where they can maybe surge or something or um yeah well you can then just do an attack and a surge yeah. and then use your mo- your unused movement action to then get out of range already mm. so there's lots of you can do lots of tricky stuff with it yeah. it's um it's good fun and um, there's also the, other... the, uh, the horns themselves, which is quite yeah. nice because you can uh, you can use an action to scream and give people um, if you scream, uh, insane survivors gain plus one movement, which is quite uh, well non deaf insane survivors gain plus one movement, which is nice because that means you've it's easy to get into monster combat with monsters, easy to move around, um, but you can also give people insanity. Yeah, that's. That's wicked. Again, that's a really that's really important when you're fighting certain uh, ne- you know certain attacks because like uh, they do intimidate to every survivor in range or on the board, and that's you know, you, you just don't need everyone going insane and, and suffering potentially brain damage in in one go and being knocked down as a result. Yeah, um, yeah it's a good set of armor, and um, I forgot that it gives you the bonus if you slam and then you make the movement and get the bonus uh, plus damage. So I need to remember that next time I'm using it. Uh, that means my epic celestial spear and on a survivor will be you know, at strength. Wow. I think I basically would be at like strength, hitting at least a, a strength eight. Oh, oh dear. Wow. You're just going to be watching out for ones at that point, aren't you? Yeah, Lance of Longinus will be great to make, but I think you need to have the um, you need to have the legendary horns to make that one. And to get legendary uh, horns, I think you have to fight a level three. Th- um, yeah, and the idea of fighting a level three antelope and having a level four lion turn up. Um, Can you even fight a level four lion? Yes, there are level. F- that's the legendary ones. I'm not too sure what the ruling is for a level four lion. Which one that you pick? Because I think that's why there's four lion types. Uh, no, there's two legendary lion types. One is the legendary lion that you fight, and I think the other one is maybe the lion that you use if you get if you go up against a level three antelope. You use oh, that no. lion as a or something weird like that. That sounds it sounds horrible. Like it, it's one of those things where um we we had one of the guys in our campaign who had had like a real he would he would argue both ways on a ruling just out of like devil's advocacy and anything where you had to make a like a judgment call just ended up causing so much trouble um like i'd i'd be tempted to just stick to a level 3 lion but then you know rule of rule of death would be that you take whatever's worse for you wouldn't you yeah um so i think we've covered everything um so the antelope and what you can get out of it is really good fun um and it's a good it's a good hunt i think one of my i think it's one of my favorite ones because i don't find it too crazy um and with the innovations there's definitely ways of fast tracking your survivors uh if you you know to get the best results out of them but there are some definite difficult choices with the principles um again i think that depend 
the, the idea of the principles, I think the idea there is whether you want to have, really, are you looking for survivors that are going to be badasses in the final battle, or are you going to have lots of survivors and you're taking battalions of them in the final battle? Uh, so I think next time, James, we will talk about the Phoenix. And we'll Fantastic. talk about it's, it's, uh, it's the plumery uh, settlement location. Um, and should we also then, I think, maybe t- look at the leather gear, because leather is great stuff. Mm-hmm. And if we can fit it in, maybe we talk about... Um, i trying to think what we talk about. Maybe we should talk about the Butcher. Ooh, start on some of the Nemesis counters. Yeah, I think we need to start talking about them, because I think we'll see what we can fit in with the Phoenix and those settlement locations. That's mostly quite a lot to talk about, as it is with the gear. Um, so, yeah, if people want to get in contact with us, they can um, they can email us at darkladiesradio at gmail.com. Uh, they can find us on Google+, Plus, our community. They can find us on Facebook. Uh, we're on Twitter, at Darker Days Radio. And we have a blog which has all of the write-up of my campaign so far and of all the stuff I've painted. Um, and if you don't agree with some of the stuff, we've got some ideas for Kingdom Death and you want to suggest weapon combos, by all means, do so. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, um, hopefully you've enjoyed listening. Uh, anything else, James? Oh, um, I just wanted to say... We've been talking about the Screaming Antelope. At Gen Con, a model got revealed for the Screaming God. Um, oh, yeah. We didn't talk about any of the Gen Con releases. So let's end with that. So we got the Screaming God. Yeah, which is... Uh, I think the Screaming God is to the Antelope what the, the Lion God is to the the, uh, the White Lion. Which okay. is an absolutely terrifying turbocharged mythical monster like the real apex of its being um and have i played one encounter against a a lion god and lost three survivors in a turn to one attack um where it just cleaved the world in twain and they all just fell to their deaths instantly um so we never went back um someone managed to knock it into a hole and we left it at that. Um, so the Screaming God, I imagine, would be quite an interesting thing to see as an expansion. Um, like, there really kind of takes on... Well, if, yeah, the Screaming Lion is like a take on what... A, it feels like a take on what a white lion could become if it became old and older beyond its years. Um, but it also has some really interesting uh, stuff in it. So, yeah, hopefully we'll see those. Um, do you want to talk about the, the models? Like, the... Um, uh, yeah, if you want to go through what, because you've got a lot, of, you've mostly got a lot of the models that they've um, re- released now as plastic, that are released as plastic kits. Yeah, because uh, they actually, they, I think they did some new ones, didn't they? Like, um, I mean, you've got, uh, you said you had the Flower Knight sent to you, but they um, they introduced a couple of sci-fi versions of um, one of the Flower Knight and one of the White Speaker. Yeah, the white speaker is also now uh, available as plastic. So I will be getting the card deck, um, the card kit to go with for her. So they're doing the card kits for some of these models that were originally done in resin um, that they've now brought out as plastic with extra cards. Um, they're going to make those cards available through card decks. Now, the other thing is some of these cards don't have ways of them, some of the gear that they get don't have means of being made in the game yet so you have to kind of wait or just add them in for fun i think that's kind of nice is that kingdom death doesn't take itself too seriously uh, i guess you could always use like the um sci-fi white speaker uh, with her gear as an alternate savior that would be quite an interesting uh yeah quite an interesting model it looks um, kind of insane and non-standard yeah some of them, like um, some of the models, got added. There's uh, there's one called Fade, who is a um, she's a white speaker who went renegade, I think. Um, yeah. And she actually has a, a a basic hunt event where she turns up, and that's how you get access to um, to the gear that it comes with, mm. which is kind of cool. Um, and as you say, they're doing packs where you'll be able to buy the um, buy this uh, buy those like additional cars themselves, like. There's Percival, she's got a hunt event and um, a secret fighting art. 
Uh, yeah, some of them have got events, settlement events, and um, fighting arts. That's uh, yeah. There's lots of cool stuff in there. Um, hmm. uh, and um, I think there was talk that um, I can't remember where I saw this, but there was something said about maybe a a new core game box with different monsters. Really? Now I have I have no idea where I saw this. Um, I you know it could be a horrible delusion on my part. Uh, but I have a feeling it was in the um, the email that went round uh, just a little while ago um, because we're still we're still waiting for the London Festival. That's still something that's uh, being worked on. Um, what have we got? Yeah, um, is that in here? No, I might be um, I might be thinking of something. Yeah, I can't I can't obviously attest to the veracity of that statement. So it's. Hmm. Um, uh, we'll see. I mean, there's obviously they're doing, they're planning doing something for the reprint of the core game. Yeah. Uh, and reprints of the expansions, of course. Uh, and of course, that's good because it'd be nice to have it constantly, you know, as near constantly in stock as possible because the markup in price that uh, people do on eBay is ridiculous. Uh, I think I saw on the Facebook group for Kingdom Death some some person did a painted paint one of the painted Kingdom Death figures. So one of the limited edition resin figures that cost like you know fifty dollars or something, and they marked up the price just because it was painted and not very well, like not very well at all. Um, very basic box standard paint, charging three hundred and fifty dollars for it, and you're just like you know uh, I just. As much as people have the free right to resell stuff and everything, on the other hand, you know, make a profit maybe if it's out of stock, but, you know, $50 versus $350 for something that's also been put together and shoddily painted. I don't want to buy stuff that's painted, you know, and Kingdom mm. Death is ultimately uh, a painter's, definitely a painter's, you know, game. Um, and uh, I just, I'm just sick of that kind of uh, kind of thing, you know. Uh, just because it's Kingdom Death that shouldn't mean you should mark it up so much. You're not gonna, and no one's gonna buy it. I mean, I've I've watched um, the prices for like you know uh, just basic Kingdom Death box games on eBay just hover at only just slightly more than their normal retail price because people are just people are going to wait for the reprint. Yeah, I think it was really good. Like, I think it was really good that it was announced that there were going to be reprints as well um, because that. There had been this really kind of rampant uh, spit and talk of reselling, and some of the prices, like I think, wasn't there something about some of it going up? Like someone was asking like a thousand dollars for it or something in the first week of getting them, and something like that. It just, mm, dear me. But it, but it is becoming like now we've it's been in the hands of everyone for like you know a good six months. Uh, people have played multiple some people play multiple campaigns i don't know how they have the time to play through that mm -hmm. uh, maybe not painting everything uh that's where i'm a bit slower um because i want stuff painted before i use it on the table um and yeah it's just just um but like asking for that amount of money is is nuts really just crazy amounts of money that um but a reprint print is going to be great because I do need to get other um, other things like um, I think Gorm or Spidercules is definitely on my list next because uh, I like the armor kit from Gorm. Um, Spidercules maybe I like even more. Uh, and the Gorm Lion would... God has the interesting mixed armor sets, which I think would be quite interesting from a play point of view, and it has a weird way that it kind of slots into campaigns. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think something like the... I hear the Manhunter is just really, really difficult mm. um, and really punishing. So I've yet to play... I mean, I, I've yet to play with a lot of the expansions because unfortunately I've just not had the uh, had the time with my current, uh, my current campaign that's been running. But I'm hoping to run, as I say, hoping to run something with the Sunstalker um, and a bunch of expansions on that. Yeah, definitely. Um... I can't think if there was anything else from what they announced at Gen Con. Um, I mean, I know they had a painted uh, frog dog up there. Oh, that'll be coming out. That's another expansion to come. Um, 
Yeah, there's definitely lots of. I mean, that's the thing. There's there's lots of stuff like Kingdom Death is not just a flash in a pan with its Kickstarter, and I think the four hundred dollar asking price. Uh, I mean, yeah, right now in pounds, the way the pounds go is a bit shite, but. You're looking at what four hundred dollars is about what three hundred pounds maybe. So you know that's the price of paying for like a PlayStation. But then at the same time, I've spent yeah you know, you're spending like what sixty plus hours, seventy hours playing Kingdom Death, and that's only a single playthrough, and that's bef- and that's discounting all the hours of putting things together and painting. It does pay off quite substantially and once you even add a small you know even even a hundred dollar expansion on like the dragon king or like the sun stalker mm-hmm. the the amount of the amount of possible gameplay um escalates again you know you've you've added another however many hundreds of hours onto the game whether you're playing with the dragon king as as a quarry or you're playing the dragon king campaign so yeah. it's interesting because like people complained about the price of kingdom death initially when it came out as both a Kickstarter and then as a, um, and then even when it had its final retail price. But then you consider like what they're doing with, um, have you seen like Invisible Sun, uh, the RPG new one from Monty Cook? And like the amount that we know about that game is minimal compared to what we knew about Kingdom Death mm-hmm. when that came out on Kickstarter. And that was asking for, for a game, and there is very little information about that RPG. And given the, how it seems very tied to its setting and and it, what it is, it doesn't. I don't know. I'm, I worry about an RPG that doesn't actually have much replay value, which is weird for an RPG. So um, yeah, I think Kingdom Death is going to do well off its reprint. People want to spend that amount of money on a board game. Um, I'm not too sure. I need to talk to someone about uh, Shadows of Brimstone because that's kind of a similar Kickstarter and similar board game. Uh, to Kingdom Death, but I get the feeling that the quality of it and uh, the replay value isn't as great, but it's Cthulhu, so it's kind of interesting. I know, maybe I can find a cheap copy at some point, or find someone that's actually got got it and I can play it. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool, I think we're done, aren't we then? Yeah, I think that's it. So, um, yeah, we said what we'll go through next time, so um, that's all everyone, and uh, good night. Good night.